This is Design Safe Radio, where natural hazards researchers strive to make our society more resilient to everything nature throws at us. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Design Safe Radio. Glad you could join us today. I'm super excited because I get to talk to my good friend, Lori Peak from UC Boulder and the Converge Center out there. Lori, it's so great to talk to you. You're one of my favorite people, and we don't get to talk very often, so this is just an absolute joy. Good to see you. Same, and it's great to see you, Dan, and thanks for having me on today. So for those who haven't heard about you and your work before, can you give us a little bit of background uh, before we get going into our topic for the day? Absolutely, and again, just thanks for having me on Design Safe Radio. I'm really excited to be back, and as Dan said, my name is Lori Peak, and I'm a professor of sociology and also the director of the Natural Hazard Center at the University of Colorado Boulder, which is one of the nation's oldest social science hazards and disaster research centers. And in 2018, with the support of the National Science Foundation, I actually had the opportunity to become the leader of the Natural Hazards Engineering Research Infrastructure Converge facility, which is the most recently added facility in the NERI network, and it's the first social science-led facility in the network. So I'm really excited to talk to you more about Converge today. Yeah, it's, it's really cool what you guys do from the intersection of engineering and social science to bringing in the background of the, the Natural Hazards Center, which has a, a long and storied history of extreme event reconnaissance work. So can you kind of give us a flavor of like in the context of, of NERI, what does an extreme event mean? Yes, and so, and I'm always cautious to speak for NERI because it is such a large and expansive network that involves so many people. But I can say from the, the sort of core definition from the when NERI was established, that really the major, I'm gonna first talk about natural hazards, then I'm gonna talk about disasters. Um, but there's answer, a big difference. Yeah, big difference. And, and really to answer your great question about what do we mean when we're using extreme events and the various networks and platforms that I know we're going to be talking about today? And so NERI really at the outset, NERI was really focused on sort of three, four major natural hazards. And so earthquake, windstorm, tsunami, and then extreme weather sort of as a, as a broader term. And one of the things, so those were sort of the core, the hazards at the core of the NERI mission. And one of the things when we joined as Converge is that um, social scientists and the social scientists that we really bring into the NERI network, we oftentimes, we don't always focus on a specific natural hazard in the same way that an engineer who may have trained and spend their entire professional career doing earthquake engineering or wind engineering. For social scientists, we're oftentimes more what I call hazard agnostic, <laughs> that we're, we're maybe we're more focused on studying a particular population. Like I study children and low-income families, or maybe there's an issue that we focus on like policy uptake or the economic costs of disaster, again, regardless of disaster type. And so where this is going is that our definite, what we sort of bring in through Converge is a focus on, I would say, a much larger range of both hazards as well as disasters. And then the last thing I'll say on that, because I think you're going to ask me this, well, that what's the difference between a hazard and a disaster? <laughs> is that right? That we think of sort of there are obviously hazards out there in the world. There are earthquakes, tsunamis, tornadoes, uh, winter storms, and so forth. So there are natural hazards. But where we oftentimes get interested and get involved is when there's that intersection between the natural hazard, the built environment, and the human environment. Mm -hmm. And we know that disasters occur at the intersection of the natural environment, the built environment, and the human environment. And so that's what's brought engineers and social scientists together for so long and has really, I think, made this field a leader in so many ways in terms of advancing multidisciplinary and increasingly interdisciplinary research. Is that old if a tree falls in a forest and nobody's around to hear it? Did it actually make a sound? <laughs> 
absolutely. And, and rightfully so social scientists, when, when there isn't that human impact. And so, for example, let's say that a, a horrible storm sweeps across the Pacific and, and might sort of knock down every tree in an uninhabited island. And an observant atmospheric scientist would undoubtedly take note of that event. But a social scientist, if there isn't that sort of human impact to it, um, might not take the same kind of notice or, or interest because it is that human impact and, yeah. and the human causes and consequences that draw us in. Yeah. And I, and I like what your distinction there because then it allows us to focus on not just, okay, what could we do, let's say in coastal Louisiana to uh, mitigate the impact of stronger and stronger hurricanes. It's if we wanted to not be affected by hurricanes in Louisiana, we could just not live there and then it wouldn't <laughs> affect us anymore. Right. I mean, that, that's right. So th those are the big and the thorny and the difficult questions. Mm -hmm. And just yesterday I was on a call with Tracy Kajeski Correa, oh, who is one of my engineering, uh, you know, colleagues and heroes. And we got to talking about what's happened with building codes in Louisiana over the past uh, several decades. And one of the things we were talking about is sort of from a straight engineering perspective, we may say we've, we've got this, like we know what needs to happen with the built environment in order to mitigate the worst effects of hurricane storm surge flooding, et cetera. But then we know that sometimes those interventions in the built environment may have a dramatic economic cost that oh, they yeah. can disproportionately disadvantage low-income populations, for example. And so what we were talking about is, right, how do you bring in the best practice from, in terms of our engineering um, what we know from the technological side, but then also how do we ensure that the solutions that we're introducing aren't further disadvantaging populations? And that's where we need to bring in that holistic yeah. multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary yeah. view. And that's and, where I see a lot of promise. And it sounds like even before you get to the disadvantaging piece of, do they even want a solution? You know, maybe the, the, architectural culture is like, we don't want to change how our buildings look. We like how Boston looks and I don't care how high the sea level rises. I want to have stuff right next to the water. You know? And right. <laughs> and, okay. and Dan, I mean, that, that's right. And that's why one of my arguments is always that many of the grand challenges that we are now facing today, they aren't just technical challenges, they're moral they're ethical, they're political, they're economic, and that means that ultimately these are social challenges. And that's why we're so excited to, again, get this opportunity to collaborate with engineers, because I think right now we are facing so many enormous and complicated challenges that it's clear that no one discipline is going to solve this alone. Mm -hmm. But that also means if we try to move forward with intervention solutions, whatever we call them, with a single disciplinary lens, that that's oftentimes when we leave out those kinds of considerations and um, could actually do harm or disadvantage and so forth. So that's why I'm such a big proponent of cross-disciplinary work, bringing in organizations, but also like you said, bringing in local people because they may already have, the, they know what's happening in their communities and they may already have great ideas for potential solutions, but they may not have the resources or the technical expertise. And so these collaborations are ever more important as our problems become more pressing and urgent. Yeah, which is a fantastic segue to our next big question of, uh, you mentioned Tracy kajuski Corey and the amazing work that she does in one of the, we call them EERs, the Extreme Event Research of Reconnaissance Groups. So can you give us a, an overview of those, those uh, groups, those NSF-funded EERs that Converge helps administer? Yes, absolutely. And thank you for asking me about this. I love talking about the EERs and the ecosystem. And so um, the National Science Foundation has actually now supports seven 
distinct. It seems like there's a new one popping up every week almost. <laughs> I know, I know. And so, and I'll, I'll say a little about that, about the history of these EERs. And so the, as Dan said, that refers to extreme events reconnaissance or extreme events research. And so the seven EERs that are currently supported by NSF and I'm going to go in order of sort of age and how long they've been around. And so the oldest EER, we'll even call it our, 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 our grandfather in the system, is GEAR, which is the Geotechnical Extreme Events Reconnaissance uh, Association. And GEAR has been around for decades and has been supported by the NSF and has done a great job of bringing together the geotechnical engineering community Initially, overwhelmingly looking at earthquakes, but over time, GEAR has expanded to um, different disaster types as well. So GEAR uh, was a first established EER. And then in 2017, the Social Science Extreme Events Research Network, or SEER, which I lead, was established by NSF, followed shortly by STEER, which is Structural Engineering, followed by the next one was NEAR, which is refers to near shore extreme events research, then followed by OSEER, which is brings together operations and systems engineering. Then we also have a SAMIR group, which I, does sustainable material management. And then there's ICEER, which is the interdisciplinary science and engineering group. And so there won't be a quiz after this, but on the Converge website, which is just converge.colorado.edu, we have a graphic that shows those seven EERs and shows their interconnection and is really meant to demonstrate that we, while we're, we're doing two things, we're both working in these EERs to bring together distinct research communities, so whether it's geotechnical engineering, structural engineering, or social sciences, so bringing together distinct groups, but also for the first time under the Converge umbrella, we can now operate as an ecosystem where we can we collaborate and we communicate with one another, mm. and so having direct connections between social scientists, structural engineers, geotechnical engineers is really making a difference in terms of us being able to learn and cross-pollinate. Thanks for listening to today's episode of Design Safe Radio. This show is sponsored by the National Science Foundation grant number 1612144. You can subscribe to Design Safe Radio on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you find your podcasts. Please leave us a review so we can improve the show. Please also help others find our episodes in iTunes. Thanks for your feedback and support. You can find out more about NARI at designsafe-ci.org on Facebook at Design Safe Radio or on Twitter at Nary Design Safe. <laughs>